Well, that was embarrassing. <laughs> the last one, apparently, I had miswired the audio. We had an echo. So we're going to do this again. So you notice that I'm not here right now. Yes, yes, it's true. I had to rearrange my lab to move the camera. So we're going to try a new experiment called Read Along Audiobooks. And that's what we're doing right now. All right, so let's go back and catch you up to where we were. Okay, boss, fess up. What's going on between you and Farnsworth? I know you went to college with him, but this guy is really rich. Why would he do all this just to help you out? Marty say shot the tequila before answering. She realized she hadn't eaten anything since this morning, and she could feel the warmth in her belly while the ghost of Zappa played on the headphones. Then she smiled a devilish grin sideways at Jacinto. What? You see me naked and you think I'm just going to spill my guts? Then she grabbed a lime wedge and squeezed it into her mouth. Jacinto was feeling the tequila too because suddenly he was not embarrassed anymore. He poured another round as an answer to her playful jab and handed her the shot glass. Here's to no secrets. Then he shot his down. No secrets except the price of this tequila, he guiltily thought to himself. But he quickly got over it. So, what's the deal? That's a long story. And that's where we left off. Okay, timer. Is away. Here we go. That's a long story, she said, and then tossed back another ounce of tequila that cost $100 per shot at a bar. Maybe I'll get drunk and tell you on the plane. In front of the helicopter, the pilot, the pilot silently cursed to himself. The naked comment by Marise got his attention. Suddenly, he wanted to know what the deal with J.L. and this beautiful Dr. Sanchez was, too. He was hoping his two passengers would continue with that conversation, but now they were talking about some archaeology mumbo-jumbo. The pilot decided he would speak to her before the plane landed at the airport. Then he turned the sound up on his headset and silently jammed to Zappa. And that is the end of chapter 20. Chapter 21. One of the important chapters. Chapter 21, time remaining, four years, nine months. Location, NSA Quantum Command Center. Date, March 12, 2008, A.D., 9.24 a.m. What's so damn important I had to be here personally? The president stormed into the Quantum Command Center. Director Martin looked up from the terminal where he stood over the shoulder of a technician. He pointed to the giant main monitor. The screen said, Contact the president regarding authorization to proceed, in large words flashing in the middle of the monitor. The president kept walking as he looked at the screen. What the hell? When he got next to the terminal with the director, he finally looked away from the giant monitor. What's it talking about? What authorization? I don't know. The director shrugged his hands as he talked to his boss. The system just locked up about an hour ago. Where the hell is Farnsworth? I thought he was supposed to take care of any problems. The president unconsciously glanced around the room while he said this, even though his conscious brain knew that J.L. had not stepped inside this building since their video conference showdown last month. His eyes finally wandered back to the giant monitor with the cryptic message as the director timidly answered him. Well, sir, he has. The, since the system came back online after you turned over the gold in Cheyenne Mountain to him, he's taken care of several technical issues, all remotely. But we can't reach him now. Why not? The president stopped and looked at the director. Because the only way he gave us to reach him was through this computer. There's an emergency contact button under the help menu, but we can't access it now. Just then, the small workstation in front of where they were standing switched screens. It now displayed a single button labeled Help. The technician at the workstation looked back over his shoulder and gulped. Then he shrugged as he looked at them both. His voice squeaked when he hesitantly spoke. What should I do? 
Director Martin looked at the president, who looked back at the technician. Then the president barked at him, Push the damn button! The technician jumped back around and pushed the help button on the touchscreen panel in front of him. The screen instantly changed and JL's face appeared. He gave them a perfunctory quick smile. How nice to see you, Mr. President. I was just thinking about you. Then he nodded toward the NSA chief. Director Martin, always a pleasure. How may I help you today? Director Martin looked at the president before answering. The president just shrugged at him. The director turned back and spoke to the image of JL on the workstation screen in front of them. Something happened a little while ago. The computer locked up. Uh, gentlemen, I'm over here on the big screen. Suddenly the sound came from behind them as the screen, and the screen in front of the technician went blank. The director and the president turned around toward the giant wall monitor. JL's face was larger than life again. Come on, step up to the front where I can see you. Much better. I can see your pretty faces now. Okay, exactly what was on the screen before you were able to reach me. It said to contact the president regarding authorization to proceed. The director spoke as he moved next to the president and the lights over him suddenly brightened. It now looked like both the president and the director had spotlights on them. The lights in the rest of the room started to dim as the president and the director looked at each other. The director shrugged his shoulders and shook his head slightly to let the president know that J.L. must be messing with the lights. For his part, J.L. hadn't moved yet, and his face was poker smooth. Suddenly, he turned slightly to the side and looked at another monitor. I see. Let me check. J.L. typed a few commands and then stopped. He looked back at the camera with a very disapproving look. Well, Director, it seems that you were trying to make Olga do something that's not legal. That's why she wouldn't do it. When you persisted in trying, she told you to contact the President. Director Martin looked at the President. Sir, there was nothing illegal about our request. It's covered under the Patriot Act. The President looked up and spoke to J.L. Director Martin says the request was legal under the Patriot Act, so what's the problem? J.L. started laughing. Then he slowly began to laugh less. Finally, he stopped. Oh, you, you were being serious. <laughs> For a minute, I thought you developed a sense of humor. J.L. started to shake his head. You know, I always wondered, but I can see now how you managed to bankrupt a professional baseball team. You're not all that bright. Mr. Farnsworth, I'm in no mood for your insults or your games. As you are so fond of reminding me, we have a treaty. If this computer is not operational, then you're in bre- Hold on there, buckaroo. JL's voice suddenly boomed through the speakers around the room like the voice of God. You're obviously still a little confused. First, your computer has a name. It's Olga. And second, this is how this works. You want Olga to do something for you under the terms of our treaty? You ask her. If she says it's okay, you get to do it. If she says you can't do it because it's illegal, then you better find another way to get what you want. Because she ain't going to help you, and neither am I. Why do you think I had you agree to a treaty? Because that way it was bound by international law. Helga and her little sister Olga don't just use American law to determine the legality of what you're trying to do. So go ahead and pass all the laws you want and put all the signing statements on any of the legislation you still have time to fuck with. Hell, appoint all the Supreme Court justices you can because it won't matter. If Olga says it's illegal, it's illegal. End of story. I know you're kind of fond of using the Constitution as your own personal urinal, but you're going to have to go back to following the rules. Whose rules? The president was shocked, but wasn't going to back down this time. Mine, for starters, J.L. said back and crossed his arms. The United States isn't going to be forced into following your rules. You will if you want to use that computer in front of you. That's not what we agreed to. The president was growing tired of this. Actually, it was. I said I'd give you a tool that you could use legally. And I never promised you anything else. Then he leaned into the camera and his face became enormous on the screen. But you, on the other hand, Mr. President, you gave me your word that you would honor our treaty and not try to come after me. You've already broken our arrangement. Someone at the State Department has been trying to access my passport file, most likely in order to track me. 
I warned you what would happen. My patience is at an end with you. JL was no longer smiling. Now the president tried a poker face. I don't know what you're talking about. I had nothing to do with anybody trying to find... Save it, shorty. You're the man in charge. You're responsible. And besides, I know you're lying. Then JL typed a few more commands and an audio waveform window opened on the immense monitor wall. As it began to play, the sound was a bit muffled, but the president could hear his own voice. All right, go ahead. But Farnsworth said he'd find out. How are you going to do it without him knowing? Then the vice president's voice came over the recording. We're going to use someone way down the chain in state. Simple passport review for perfectly legitimate reasons. We won't even use his name, just his number in a series of passport numbers that are called up for routine review. It's the same thing we did, just did when we were digging up dirt on the Democrat candidates. Nobody will know. When we find him, we have Delta go get him, then bring him back to us. The audio player file disappeared from the screen. JL started to smile. Would you like to change your bullshit story? Or shall I post this on the internet with the video of you promising to leave me alone? And by the way, I've sent this to all the Democrat candidates. You probably just insured their election in the fall. Congratulations. Then JL's face went blank again as he dropped his smile and leaned in close to the camera. The president dropped his jaw. The color also drained from his face. How did you get that recording? We were in the Oval Office. You can't get a bug in there. J.L. smiled very slowly this time. He was still close to the camera. For a moment, he looked pleasant. Then suddenly, the muscles in his face contracted in tiny, almost indistinguishable ways, and he got a menacing look. The size of the monitor and the close proximity of J.L. to the camera made it look like he was actually staring down upon the president. His voice deepened slightly, and he made the president wait just a moment longer than the socially accepted delay in responding. When he finally spoke, it was clearly in a threatening tone, and it was aimed squarely at the man standing before him. As long as you are standing on this planet, I can listen in on you. It was just a boast. For JL to electronically eavesdrop on someone, they actually had to be standing near a phone line or something electrical, even the electricity in the wall, which was how he recorded the Oval Office. It was a trick he had just recently learned how to do using quantum fluctuations in background static. It was a technique that required such enormous processing capabilities, the only computer powerful enough to accomplish it was his computer. But JL wasn't going to let the president know that. He continued with his threatening posture and tone. You lied to me. You fucking lied to my face, Mr. President. I've had it with you speaking to me this way. You will show me some respect. God damn it, I'm the president. Not for much longer, JL smiled even larger at this. The president pointed his finger at the giant screen. I'm still in office, you little shit. You're not the only one with leverage. Mr. Farnsworth, your little magic tricks with your computer are going to come to an end. I've still got time to make sure of that. I don't care what our fucking contract says. I'll be damned if I'm going to let you have any control over my nuclear silos ever again. Nobody fucking threatens me. The president was almost yelling. JL kept smiling. After a delayed pause, he calmly responded, What are you going to do, little man? I'm not Saddam Hussein, or Kim Jong-il for that matter. I'm not trying to obtain nukes. I've already got nukes. Yours. Remember? Do I need to remind you? You can't use those nukes. You know you can't arm them. So go ahead and open the silo doors. No country's going to launch a preemptive strike against the U.S. because a computer glitch opens a door on a missile, whether they're armed or not. The president had calmed down, but he had that smug look again. I see you failed to take my warning about playing chess with me. J.L. returned the smug face. So here's something else you should consider. I can make your computers say they're armed. Well, 
So here's something else you should consider. I may not be able to arm those missiles, but you already know I can make your computers say they're armed. Well, here's something I bet you didn't know. I can launch those missiles. Oh, yes, indeedy, I can. And you can't stop me. And you know what the Chinese and the Russians will do when they detect incoming missiles that their systems will say are armed, as will yours? Do you think they're going to wait until your missiles land before they respond in kind? I believe the nature of mutually assured destruction would dictate a somewhat more drastic and timely course of action. And by the time your bombs land and don't go boom because they're not armed, uh, you'll have about 10 minutes to accept the apologies of China and Russia because their missiles can't be called back and they are armed you want to fight with me you're going to fight with my two new friends and business partners and you're going to lose jl stopped here and sat back in his chair the president was actually speechless and the smug look was gone jl started back up oh and i'm sure you've discovered by now actually I read the email that General LeBlanc sent you, so I know you're aware that you can't just disconnect those missile silos unless you want to take them offline. And as soon as you do that, I'll know, and I'll take appropriate action. You'll be responsible for making your country glow from nuclear fallout. The president stumbled at his words. You, you, you're bluffing. You'll, you'll never do that. That's nuclear holocaust. The president got a very sober look and straightened his posture. J.L. stopped and looked intensely at the president. Then he relaxed and smiled. For a moment there, I thought you might actually be thinking, but you're just blustering, and we'll stop there. All right, there we go. And mark. Okay. Now I know that it should be doing it this time, so... Let's go back and see that that's working. Yes, it is. Everything looks good. The audio looks good. Everything looks good. No drop frames anywhere. No double audio. Sorry about that, guys. I will see you guys tomorrow because this is much later than I normally finish. And my kids are waiting for me to tell them good night. So I will see you guys in the morning. Just the facts, ma'am. Tonight's story was brought to you by Dread Pirate Lucian. He is the bad Lucian. <laughs>